Chapter 15 of Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter 15 In which Rebecca's husband appears for a short time. Every reader of a sentimental turn, and we desire no other, must have been pleased with the tableau with which the last act of our little drama concluded for what can be prettier than an image of love on his knees before beauty but when love heard that awful confession from beauty that she was married already he bounced up from his attitude of humility on the carpet uttering exclamations which caused poor little beauty to be more frightened than she was when she made her avowal married you're joking the baronet cried after the first explosion of rage and wonder you're making fun of me becky who'd ever go to marry you without a shilling to your fortune married married rebecca said in an agony of tears her voice choking with emotion her handkerchief up to her ready eyes fainting against the mantelpiece a figure of woe fit to melt the most obdurate heart oh sir pitt dear sir pitt do not think me ungrateful for all your goodness to me it is only your generosity that has extorted my secret generosity be hanged sir pitt roared out who is it to then you're married where was it let me come back with you to the country sir let me watch over you as faithfully as ever don't don't separate me from dear queen's crawley the feller has left you has he the baronet said beginning as he fancied to comprehend well becky come back if you like you can't eat your cake and have it anyways i made you a fair offer come back as governess you shall have it all your own way she held out one hand she cried fit to break her heart her ringlets fell over her face and over the marble mantelpiece where she laid it so the rascal ran off eh sir pitt said with a hideous attempt at consolation never mind becky i'll take care of ee oh sir it would be the pride of my life to go back to queen's crawley and take care of the children and of you as formerly when you said you were pleased with the services of your little rebecca when i think of what you have just offered me my heart fills with gratitude indeed it does i can't be your wife sir let me let me be your daughter saying which rebecca went down on her knees in a most tragical way and taking sir pitt's horny black hand between her own two which were very pretty and white and as soft as satin looked up at his face with an expression of exquisite pathos and confidence when when the door opened and miss crawley sailed in miss firkin and miss briggs who happened by chance to be at the parlour door soon after the baronet and rebecca entered the apartment had also seen accidentally through the keyhole the old gentleman prostrate before the governess and had heard the generous proposal which he made her it was scarcely out of his mouth when miss firkin and miss briggs had streamed up the stairs had rushed into the drawing-room where miss crawley was reading the french novel and had given the old lady the astounding intelligence that sir pitt was on his knees proposing to miss sharp and if you calculate the time for the above dialogue to take place the time for briggs and firkin to fly to the drawing-room the time for miss crawley to be astonished and to drop her volume of pigot le brun and the time for her to come downstairs you will see how exactly accurate this history is and how miss crawley must have appeared at the very instant when rebecca had assumed the attitude of humility it is the lady on the ground and not the gentleman miss crawley said with a look and voice of great scorn they told me that you were on your knees sir pitt 
do kneel once more and let me see this pretty couple i have thanked sir pitt crawley ma'am rebecca said rising and have told him that that i never can become lady crawley refused him miss crawley said more bewildered than ever briggs and firkin at the door opened the eyes of astonishment and the lips of wonder yes refused rebecca continued with a sad tearful voice and am i to credit my ears that you absolutely proposed to her sir pitt the old lady asked yes said the baronet i did and she refused you as she says yes sir pitt said his features on a broad grin it does not seem to break your heart at any rate miss crawley remarked not a bit answered sir pitt with a coolness and good humour which set miss crawley almost mad with bewilderment that an old gentleman of station should fall on his knees to a penniless governess and burst out laughing because she refused to marry him that a penniless governess should refuse a baronet with four thousand a year these were mysteries which miss crawley could never comprehend it surpassed any complications of intrigue in her favourite pigot le brun i'm glad you think it good sport brother she continued groping wildly through this amazement famous said sir pitt who'd a thought it what a sly little devil what a fox it was he muttered to himself chuckling with pleasure who'd have thought what cries miss crawley stamping with her foot pray miss sharp are you waiting for the prince regent's divorce that you don't think our family good enough for you my attitude rebecca said when you came in ma'am did not look as if i despised such an honour as this good this noble man has deigned to offer me do you think i have no heart have you all loved me and been so kind to the poor orphan deserted girl and i am to feel nothing oh my friends oh my benefactors may not my love my life my duty try to repay the confidence you have shown me do you grudge me even gratitude miss crawley it is too much my heart is too full and she sank down in a chair so pathetically that most of the audience present were perfectly melted with her sadness whether you marry me or not you're a good little girl becky and i'm your friend mind said sir pitt and putting on his crape-bound hat he walked away greatly to rebecca's relief for it was evident that her secret was unrevealed to miss crawley and she had the advantage of a brief reprieve putting her handkerchief to her eyes and nodding away honest briggs who would have followed her upstairs she went up to her apartment while briggs and miss crawley in a high state of excitement remained to discuss the strange event and firkin not less moved dived down into the kitchen regions and talked of it with all the male and female company there and so impressed was mrs firkin with the news that she thought proper to write off by that very night's post with a humble duty to mrs bute crawley and the family at the rectory and sir pitt has been and proposed for to marry miss sharp wherein she has refused him to the wonder of all the two ladies in the dining-room where worthy miss briggs was delighted to be admitted once more to confidential conversation with her patroness wondered to their hearts content at sir pitt's offer and rebecca's refusal briggs very acutely suggesting there must have been some obstacle in the shape of a previous attachment otherwise no young woman in her senses would ever have refused so advantageous a proposal you would have accepted it yourself wouldn't you briggs miss crawley said kindly would it not be a privilege to be miss crawley's sister briggs replied with meek evasion well becky would have made a good lady crawley after all miss crawley remarked 
who was mollified by the girl's refusal, and very liberal and generous now there was no call for her sacrifices. She has brains in plenty, much more wit in her little finger than you have, my poor dear Briggs, in all your head. Her manners are excellent, now I have formed her. She is a Montmorency, Briggs, and blood is something, although I despise it for my part. And she would have held her own amongst those pompous, stupid Hampshire people, much better than that unfortunate ironmonger's daughter. Briggs coincided as usual, and the previous attachment was then discussed in conjectures. "'You poor friendless creatures are always having some foolish tendre. Miss Crawley said. "'You yourself, you know, were in love with a writing-master. "'Don't cry, Briggs, you are always crying, and it won't bring him to life again. "'And I suppose this unfortunate Becky has been silly and sentimental too. "'Some apothecary, or house-steward, or painter, or young curate, something of that sort.' poor thing poor thing says briggs who was thinking of twenty-four years back and that hectic young writing-master whose lock of yellow hair and whose letters beautiful in their illegibility she cherished in her old desk upstairs poor thing poor thing says briggs once more she was a fresh-cheeked lass of eighteen she was at evening church, and the hectic writing-master and she were quavering out of the same psalm-book. "'After such conduct on Rebecca's part,' Miss Crawley said enthusiastically, "'our family should do something. Find out who is the objet, Briggs. I'll set him up in a shop, or order my portrait of him, you know. Or speak to my cousin, the bishop and i'll dote a becky and we'll have a wedding briggs and you shall make the breakfast and be the bridesmaid briggs declared that it would be delightful and vowed that her dear miss crawley was always kind and generous and went upstairs to rebecca's bedroom to console her and prattle about the offer and the refusal and the cause thereof and to hint at the generous intentions of miss crawley and to find out who was the gentleman that had the mastery of Miss Sharp's heart. Rebecca was very kind, very affectionate and affected, responded to Briggs's offer of tenderness with grateful fervour, owned there was a secret attachment, a delicious mystery. What a pity Miss Briggs had not remained half a minute longer at the keyhole! Rebecca might, perhaps, have told more, but five minutes after Miss Briggs's arrival in Rebecca's apartment, Miss Crawley actually made her appearance there, an unheard-of honour. Her impatience had overcome her. She could not wait for the tardy operations of her ambassadress, so she came in person and ordered Briggs out of the room. And expressing her approval of Rebecca's conduct, she asked particulars of the interview, and the previous transactions which had brought about the astonishing offer of Sir Pitt. Rebecca said she had long had some notion of the partiality with which Sir Pitt honoured her, for he was in the habit of making his feelings known in a very frank and unreserved manner. But, not to mention private reasons, with which she would not for the present trouble Miss Crawley, Sir Pitt's age, station, and habits were such as to render a marriage quite impossible. And could a woman with any feeling of self-respect and any decency listen to proposals at such a moment, when the funeral of the lover's deceased wife had not actually taken place? Nonsense, my dear. You would never have refused him, had there not been someone else in the case miss crawley said coming to the point at once tell me the private reasons what are the private reasons there is some one who is it that has touched your heart rebecca cast down her eyes and owned there was you have guessed right dear lady she said with a sweet simple faltering voice 
you wonder at one so poor and friendless having an attachment don't you i have never heard that poverty was any safeguard against it i wish it were my poor dear child cried miss crawley who was always quite ready to be sentimental is our passion unrequited then are we pining in secret tell me all and let me console you i wish you could dear madam rebecca said in the same tearful tone indeed indeed i need it and she laid her head upon miss crawley's shoulder and wept there so naturally that the old lady surprised into sympathy embraced her with an almost maternal kindness uttered many soothing protests of regard and affection for her vowed that she loved her as a daughter and would do everything in her power to serve her and now who is it my dear is it that pretty miss sedley's brother you said something about an affair with him i'll ask him here my dear and you shall have him indeed you shall don't ask me now rebecca said you shall know all soon indeed you shall dear kind miss crawley dear friend may i say so that you may my child the old lady replied kissing her i can't tell you now sobbed out rebecca i am very miserable but oh love me always promise you will love me always and in the midst of mutual tears for the emotions of the younger woman had awakened the sympathies of the elder this promise was solemnly given by miss crawley who left her little protege blessing and admiring her as a dear artless tender-hearted affectionate incomprehensible creature and now she was left alone to think over the sudden and wonderful events of the day and of what had been and what might have been what think you were the private feelings of miss no begging your pardon of mrs rebecca if a few pages back the present writer claimed the privilege of peeping into miss amelia sedley's bedroom and understanding with the omniscience of the novelist all the gentle pains and passions which were tossing upon that innocent pillow why should he not declare himself to be rebecca's confidant too master of her secrets and seal-keeper of that young woman's conscience well then in the first place rebecca gave way to some very sincere and touching regrets that a piece of marvellous good fortune should have been so near her and she actually obliged to decline it in this natural emotion every properly regulated mind will certainly share what good mother is there that would not commiserate a penniless spinster who might have been my lady and have shared four thousand a year what well-bred young person is there in all vanity fair who will not feel for a hard-working ingenious meritorious girl who gets such an honourable advantageous provoking offer just at the very moment when it is out of her power to accept it i am sure our friend becky's disappointment deserves and will command every sympathy i remember one night being in the fair myself at an evening party i observed old miss toady there also present single out for her special attentions and flattery little mrs briefless the barrister's wife who is of a good family certainly but as we all know is as poor as poor can be what i asked in my own mind can cause this obsequiousness on the part of miss toady has briefless got a county court or has his wife had a fortune left her miss toady explained presently with that simplicity which distinguishes all her conduct you know she said mrs briefless is the granddaughter of sir john redhand who is so ill at cheltenham that he can't last six months mrs briefless's papa succeeds so you see 
she will be a baronet's daughter and toady asked briefless and his wife to dinner the very next week if the mere chance of becoming a baronet's daughter can procure a lady such homage in the world surely surely we may respect the agonies of a young woman who has lost the opportunity of becoming a baronet's wife who would have dreamed of lady crawley dying so soon she was one of those sickly women who might have lasted these ten years rebecca thought to herself in all the woes of repentance and i might have been my lady i might have led that old man whither i would i might have thanked mrs bute for her patronage and mr pitt for his insufferable condescension i would have had the town-house newly furnished and decorated i would have had the handsomest carriage in london and a box at the opera and i would have been presented next season all this might have been and now now all was doubt and mystery but rebecca was a young lady of too much resolution and energy of character to permit herself much useless and unseemly sorrow for the irrevocable past so having devoted only the proper portion of regret to it she wisely turned her whole attention towards the future which was now vastly more important to her and she surveyed her position and its hopes doubts and chances in the first place she was married that was a great fact sir pitt knew it she was not so much surprised into the avowal as induced to make it by a sudden calculation it must have come some day and why not now as at a later period he who would have married her himself must at least be silent with regard to her marriage how miss crawley would bear the news was the great question misgivings rebecca had but she remembered all miss crawley had said the old lady's avowed contempt for birth her daring liberal opinions her general romantic propensities her almost doting attachment to her nephew and her repeatedly expressed fondness for rebecca herself she is so fond of him rebecca thought that she will forgive him anything she is so used to me that i don't think she could be comfortable without me when the eclaircissement comes there will be a scene and hysterics and a great quarrel and then a great reconciliation at all events what use was there in delaying the die was thrown and now or to-morrow the issue must be the same and so resolved that miss crawley should have the news the young person debated in her mind as to the best means of conveying it to her and whether she should face the storm that must come or fly and avoid it until its first fury was blown over in this state of meditation she wrote the following letter dearest friend the great crisis which we have debated about so often is come half of my secret is known and i have thought and thought until i am quite sure that now is the time to reveal the whole of the mystery sir pitt came to me this morning and made what do you think a declaration in form think of that poor little me i might have been lady crawley how pleased mrs bute would have been and ma tante if i had taken precedence of her i might have been somebody's mamma instead of oh i tremble i tremble when i think how soon we must tell all sir pitt knows i am married and not knowing to whom is not very much displeased as yet ma tante is actually angry that i should have refused him but she is all kindness and graciousness she condescends to say i would have made him a good wife and vows that she will be a mother to your little rebecca she will be shaken when she first hears the news but need we fear anything beyond a momentary anger i think not i am sure not she dotes upon you so you naughty good-for-nothing man 
that she would pardon you anything and indeed i believe the next place in her heart is mine and that she would be miserable without me dearest something tells me we shall conquer you shall leave that odious regiment quit gaming racing and be a good boy and we shall live in park lane and ma tante shall leave us all her money i shall try and walk to-morrow at three in the usual place if miss b accompanies me you must come to dinner and bring an answer and put it in the third volume of portius's sermons but at all events come to your own ah to miss eliza styles at mr barnet's sadler knightsbridge and i trust there is no reader of this little story who has not discernment enough to perceive that the miss eliza styles an old schoolfellow rebecca said with whom she had resumed an active correspondence of late and who used to fetch these letters from the saddlers wore brass spurs and large curling moustachios and was indeed no other than captain rawdon crawley End of chapter 15